Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you being here today. We'll get started. My name is Tim Ripp. I'm a horticultural outreach specialist for Sauk County. And today I have with me Ann Weed, who is also a horticultural outreach specialist from Waukesha County. We'll be your moderators for today. Please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. Should you, you should be able to find us at the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop. If you're using a cell phone or a tablet, you might need to tap the screen to bring up the menu with the Q&A feature. We will get to as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation today. We are not using the chat feature, so please do not put your questions there. We're recording this webinar, and the link to the recording will be on the Extension Horticultural website. Um, we have also dropped uh, in the chat feature a handout for this presentation. And we will drop in the chat at the end of the presentation a link to our survey. We would appreciate you filling that out for us. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Janelle Weir, who is a horticultural outreach specialist for Marathon and Wood Counties, and her presentation on maintaining your festive house plants. Janelle, to you. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. Um, if you would like, please go ahead. If you're able to and if you would like, please go ahead and click on that handout in the chat. Um, basically, what I've done is I've given you all of my notes. I've given you some resources, extension resources, um, to give you more information about each of the plants we're going to talk about today. And I also have a link to the Google map that I'll be showing you today. So if you want to take a look at some of the pictures that we go through today, that's where you'll find them. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen really quick here. All right, and we see a map. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So the way you navigate, this is a Google map that I created. Um, and the way you navigate through this map is if you look on the left hand side, you'll see a place where you can do check marks. When you hit those check marks, it'll activate different areas on the map. So we're going to start off. Today we're going to, I'm going to talk about Norfolk Island pines holiday cactus, poinsettias, and if we've got time, amaryllis too. If we don't get to the amaryllis, no problem. I've got all that information at the bottom of the handout for you. So let's start off with Norfolk Island pines. We're going to go to where Norfolk Island pines are native, and turns out it's Norfolk Island. If we click on the marker on the map, that's going to take us to a geotagged picture. This is Mount Pitt Lookout in Norfolk Island. And if you look at the picture right away where it lands us, we can see some Norfolk Island pines growing right here. So these plants that the needles are kind of turned upwards, those are gonna be your Norfolk Island pines. So as I scroll around this picture, what I want you to think about is given the conditions where it's native, I want you to be thinking about what conditions can you provide for these plants inside your house if you want to keep it at your house? So I'm going to spin us back around where we started. Um, so first things first, I do want to mention that even though the common name is Norfolk Island pine, um, they aren't a true pine, but they are a conifer. Um, Norfolk Island pine is just a common name that uh, Westerners have given it. So when we're thinking about this location where they are, they are native, one of the things that comes to mind when we're thinking about those conditions inside our house is we can tell this plant likely thrives in high humidity, right? It's an island in the middle of the ocean. So this location probably has quite a bit of humidity. So when we're thinking about inside of our house, how can we emulate high humidity? Well, one of the ways that we could do it is if the plant is particularly small, say in a four to a six inch pot, we could utilize a humidity tray. A humidity tray is just a some sort of container um, with a bit of a lip to it. And what we do is we'll put something non-porous on the very bottom. Marbles work great, rocks work great, anything that's going to be non-porous. Um, even like sea glass would be fantastic and that awfully pretty too. And then inside that tray, you're going to add some water, not above the rocks, but just below the rocks. And then you set your plant on top of the rocks. So that way they're surrounded by water, but they're not sitting in water. So for your smaller plants, like I said, the ones that are in four to six, six inch containers, humidity trays might be helpful to increase the humidity for them. 
Um, if we're dealing with larger plants, we might be looking at either grouping the plants together that will help out with humidity or setting the plants in a room that has a humidifier. The next thing we want to think about when we're thinking about those conditions to thrive for our Norfolk Island pines there is going to be what kind of light are they going to, to need. Now um, you can keep a Norfolk Island pine in a say north facing window that doesn't get a whole lot of light, but it's not going to thrive under those conditions. Instead, what you want to do is inside your home, shoot for a nice bright location, a south and east or a west facing window is going to be your best bet. And you want to make sure that you're rotating your plants often, they will tend to start to lean towards the light if you don't rotate them. Okay. As um, far as temperatures go, this is a really temperate uh, area on our planet. And so you want to keep them in consistent temperatures between 55 and 70 degrees. You want to avoid um, any sort of significant quick changes in temperature. So we're going to want to keep them away from drafty windows or maybe drafty doors. Um, one other thing to kind of keep in mind about Norfolk Island pines is they are tolerant to salt. Remember, they are located over here on an island. So in the middle, right in the middle of the ocean. So they will be tolerant to some salt. Um, one thing you want to keep in mind, if you are having some issues with them, the biggest issue you're probably going to have is some needle drop happening. If that happens, you need to take a close look at the humidity conditions that you're giving it, probably increase the humidity. Otherwise, the correct water needs aren't being met. You're probably either keeping it too wet or too dry. So you'll probably want to take a look at those, wa that wa those water needs and um, fix those a little bit. When you are deciding which types of Norfolk Island pine or which Norfolk Island pine that you want to get, so you're looking at them inside the store, avoid plants that have been painted or glittered. Um, and you'll know what I'm talking about when you see them. They'll have a real pretty glitter and they look fantastic, especially as a tiny little Christmas tree. But that glitter or the paint that they put on them interferes with photosynthesis. So look for the ones that are still natural. Norfolk Island pines typically will only grow about six feet indoors, but they can get up to 40 feet or I'm sorry, 20 feet indoors if the conditions um, for them to thrive are met. All right, so that gave us a little bit of a idea of what to expect out of our Norfolk Island Pines. Let's go back to our map. And now we're gonna investigate holiday cactus. That's gonna bring us over here to South America. Bear with me while I scroll in. So this purple line here, that's going to give us their native range. And I've got a little picture right here, a geotagged picture, that is right in the center of their native range. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at what we've got and see if we can figure out those best conditions again for how to keep them happy. So I've selected this picture in particular. Let's just take a little view. We can see very tropical, very green. I picked this picture in particular, however, because we've got this fantastic example of this rock with all of these plants growing on the rock. This is what you could expect to find, or this is where you would expect to find a holiday cactus growing in its native habitat. They, um, they like to grow in the crotches of trees or in the crotches of rocks in the little crevices where a little bit of organic matter and soil will build up here. So you could expect to see them. I don't think there's a uh, holiday cactus any growing inside this rock. Resolution isn't really good enough for me to be able to zoom in to tell for sure. But this is where we this is the type of setting that we would expect to see them. So thinking about that. Um, and thinking about, you know, it's a, a tropical plant. It's definitely an understory plant and it doesn't grow very tall. So 
the light conditions that we're going to be looking for are going to be a north or an eastern window. If let's say, you know, the only window that you've got perhaps that you live inside an apartment and the only window you have is going to be a south or a west facing window, that's okay. You're just going to want to make sure that you're providing a little bit of shade for it. So that might be something as simple as sheer curtains. They benefit from going outside. I take mine outdoors every day, every year. Uh, but when you do take them outdoors in the summertime, just make sure that you set them in a location that's going to be filtered sunlight um, to part shade. So underneath trees are going to do a fantastic job of mimicking their natural setting. As far as water conditions go, even though they have cacti in the name or in the common name that we give them, holiday cactus, um, we're not going to treat them the same as we would a desert cactus. So we've already kind of talked a little bit about how the light conditions, we're not going to put it in full sun. We're going to put it in, in kind of an understory light conditions or uh, north facing light conditions. With water, what we want to do is treat it like we would the rest of our tropical house plants. So we would don't want it to have really soggy soil. Soggy soil is going to result in rotting plants or if it's in bud, if it's in flower, um, the flowers will fall off, the flowers will abort. And what you may end up happening is the plant, the entire plant wilting. They do like to be dry. Um, they like the surface to be dry. You know, so you're going to water them just like you would your other tropicals. During the blooming period, though, they go through a little bit more water and more humidity. So that's something that you're going to want to keep an eye on. Um, so as it's going into bloom, right about now, this time of year, for at least a Christmas and a Thanksgiving cactus, you're going to want to uh, give them a little bit more water. When they're finished blooming, you're going to pull back on that water until St. Patrick's Day. Um, as far as soil goes, keeping in mind that, you know, they're basically epiphytes. They grow in these places where they don't have really deep or rich soil. So good drainage is going to be very important. Um, any peat-based or core-based uh, soil will work well. And they don't have expansive root systems, so keep them pot-bound. They like to be tight inside their pots. You can repot them about once every three years. And the same rule goes for them as the rest of your container plants. You only go up one size with, which eat, with each repotting. Um, humidity, they are succulents, and so they don't really care about dry conditions except for when they're in bloom. If it's especially dry, those flowers will not last very long. So if you want the flowers to last longer, give them a little bit of humidity during their blooming cycle. And then fertilizer, um, during the months of June through August, go ahead and give them a balanced fertilizer at about half the strength. And then in the fall, when you notice the tips of the um, leaves starting to set buds, that would be a great time to switch over to a high, for, high phosphorus fertilizer. I like to think of high phosphorus fertilizers as kind of being pyramids, or we can think of them as kind of Christmas tree shaped where you know, the lower numbers are on the edges and the higher numbers up at the top. So your lower number is, um, or so what you would be looking for for a high phosphorus fertilizer would be something like maybe a 515.5, okay? You're going to give that to it right when it's in its blooming cycle, and then as soon as it's finished blooming, you can cut off the fertilizer. So how do we tell the difference between our different cacti? Well, let me first bear with me just a second. Okay, so here I have, um, I actually took these off of my um, multi cactus, my holiday cactus bowl. Um, so here we've got the three different types of holiday cactus. You'll really be able to tell them apart by their leaf um, shape. So the one that typically is called a Thanksgiving cactus is going to have really kind of sharp. I almost think of them as like little um, tines off of the edges. So you can tell that's going to be shaped a little bit different than the one that blooms a little bit later, the Christmas cactus. This one's going to have a, just not as quite as sharp of uh, ends on the leaves, a little bit more curved. And we can really tell them different from 
the one that will bloom later in the season, the Easter one. This one is very, very rounded. In your handout, I have a nice um, illustration that shows you the differences between them. All right. Holiday cactus are very long lived and they tend to be generational plants. So it's not um, rare for me to hear from somebody that they've got a part of their grandmother's or even their great grandmother's plants. Um, I think this is why they tend to be such a have a soft spot in many of our hearts. They are succulents, like I said, but they don't want really super sunny or super dry locations. Remember in the picture, they are understory plants. So how do we get them to flower? Well, the Thanksgiving and the Christmas ones are both short day plants. They require short days and cool night, cool nighttime temperatures. So one, the, probably the easiest way to encourage them to go into flower is to leave them outdoors right up until the temperatures start to drop below 32 degrees. So you're going to keep them out there when the temperatures are right in the low 40s high 30s, leave them out there up until then and then go ahead and bring them indoors. Um, once they're indoors, set them in a bright location with daytime temperatures between say 65 to 70 degrees. Once they're exposed to cooler nighttime temperatures of around 55 degrees or less, they're going to bloom within five to six weeks. Without the fluctuation of temperatures um, of less than 55 degrees, so let's say that you keep your house heated right at 65 to 68 degrees, then you're going to have to induce darkness to get them to go into flower. And that darkness is going to need to the the you're, what you're going to need to do is have them in complete darkness for 12 hours per day for about six weeks. You can achieve this um, probably most easily by having a box that you can set a, right on top of the plant. Um, maybe, you know, have it part of your routine. You wake up in the morning, you drink your cup of coffee, you take the box off of your plant. And then right before you go to bed, when you go to brush your teeth at night, you put the box back on the top of your plant. This way I'll have complete darkness and you're going to do that for about six weeks. Um, keep in mind if the night if it's exposed to temperatures over 65 degrees at night you're going to struggle to get it to rebloom. So if you've had troubles getting your cactus to your holiday cactus to bloom it might be because those nighttime temperatures just aren't quite cool enough. Um, and then I've got some information in the handout about what to look for and how to troubleshoot for um, if you've got any problems with them. I'm going to jump real quick though. Ahead to poinsettias. So I'm gonna click off of that, click onto our poinsettias and scroll out. And poinsettias are native to Mexico. So this red line shows um, about their native range. And let's start off. This is a picture from a botanical garden in Mexico that shows typically where you'll find um, poinsettias growing. Poinsettias are, they're actually small shrubs and they will grow, um, like I said, on the, along the coast of Mexico. So kind of looking at this picture, what can we tell about the conditions it would need to thrive? Well, I said there was a shrub. I want to say they grow about, say, six to eight feet, 10 feet in their native environments. So they're not, a, they're not as tall as some of the trees. They're an understory plant, but they're not quite like our uh, holiday cactus. They, they are a shrub. And so they're gonna, they're gonna outcompete a bit for that light. So we wanna give them indoors, we wanna give them nice bright light, east, south, or west facing windows. Um, if you take them outdoors in the summertime, you're not gonna put the, expose them to full sun. You're gonna give them, um, some some direct sunlight, but only about six hours. If you give them more than six hours of direct light, you might cause the bracts to fade. 
As far as temperatures go, they are pretty finicky. They want to maintain 65 to 70 degrees at all times. They do not tolerate any fluctuations, so no drafts. Keep in mind, they're going to be very angry if they're put into a drafty spot. If they're exposed to temperatures less than uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to notice significant damage. So make sure that you're keeping those uh, temperatures maintained really right at that 65 to 70 degree area. They prefer evenly moist soil. Do not let them wilt. Um, if, you, if they end up wilting on you, they're very quick to drop their leaves. So if you purchase one at the stores, oftentimes what you'll find is the bottom will be wrapped in a foil. Go ahead and remove that foil as soon as you get it home because what will happen is people will water them and some of the water will drain out of the bottom, but it'll be trapped inside the foil. And so they end up sitting in water. That's, when we, that's another time where we see the leaves start to drop very quickly. Don't let them stay sitting in, in water. They prefer high humidity. Thinking about the picture that we're showing here, we can see it's definitely a high humidity environment. Um, far as fertilizing goes, just like with the rest of your tropicals, you're not going to be fertilizing this in the winter time. You're going to grow it just like you with the rest of your tropical house plants. Um, during the growing season, go ahead and give it a fertil. Go ahead and give it a balanced fertilizer at about half the strength once a month during that growing season. Often I get the question, are poinsettias poisonous, um, especially to cats or other pets? Poinsettias are in the euphorbia family, and so they've got a latex. When you break them, you'll see this white, milky, kind of sticky um, sap coming from them. It's called a latex. That latex is an irritant um, and it will cause a skin rash. Um, it'll also cause a rash to pets. Um, it will, uh, it might mm, irritate their uh, eyes. It could irritate their mouths, but it's not poisonous. They're not gonna die if they eat it. They're just gonna be irritated by it. So you wanna keep them out of the reach for the pets, but uh, keep in mind if they do end up nibbling on some of it, they're not going to die. Going back to our, our uh, going back to our map here, just wanted to show you this location right here. So this was closer to what is now Mexico City. That would have been the um, uh, capital for the Aztec Empire as well. So poinsettias were cultivated by the Aztecs. Um, it was cultivated in, and I'm going to do my best here with the pronunciations. Oaxaca, which, what is, what is, which is now in the state of Morelos. It was prized by King Netzauhaukoyotl and Montezmusa. Um, the indigenous, indigenous name for poinsettias is Quetlachotitl. And I have hyperlinks in the handout for correct pronunciations of all of those. My apologies if I didn't quite get those pronunciations just right, quite right. The Aztecs used the brax um, for dye and the latex to treat fever. They played a part in the midwinter celebrations representing purity and blood sacrifices. They were cultivated in gardens. In the 1600s, Franciscan monks saw these plants blooming near the hol Christian holiday of Christmas, and they adopted the Aztec symbolism of blood to European religious concepts. Um, there is a link to a Minnesota Extension publication, and in it, they use holidays to help us remember uh, different steps of cultivation as we go through the year that will help us to get these plants to reflower. Although I'm going to be honest with you, I just tend to end up throwing um, my poinsettias away at the end of the season because they really are difficult to reflower. If you do want to, the, uh, I've got the uh, notes per calendar days all ready for you. All right. Well, I want to, I could keep talking, but I'm going to go ahead and stop talking for a moment because um, I want to leave, leave us plenty of time for questions.
And um, I am apologize, I didn't quite get through to Amaryllis, but like I said, if you check out that handout, you're going to find information for how to take care of an Amaryllis as well. Thank you, Janelle. We'll jump in here with a few questions right away. Um, I have a question here. What is the best way to debug your holiday cactus after they've been outside all summer? Yeah, so I, um, the way that I handle them is the first thing I'll do is I will tip them carefully on their side, rinse them with a uh, fine spray of water, try to knock off as many of those um, insects down there as possible. Typically, what you're going to find on your holiday cactus are going to be mealies, um, although there are some other pests that might be on there as well. And then um, what I will do, because they are not in bloom, at that point in the season, I often will use a uh, systemic insecticide that is appropriate for houseplants and add that then. Um, leave it on the, I'll leave them outdoors for a couple of days because the systemic insecticide can smell kind of bad. And then I'll bring them inside. Typically those systemic insecticides cover the plant for about eight weeks. And so that will help me to protect it from mealies going into the part of the year that it's gonna be stuck indoors with me. All right. Another question here for you is what kind of fertilizer should we use in June through August for holiday cactuses? From June through August, I would use a balanced one. So um, you could use, if you could find one, I think I would find probably uh, it, something that's water soluble. So either liquid or even the powdered ones that you add water to, but I would be shooting for something that's a balanced, so the same number all the way across. 10, 10, 10 is going to look fantastic. Um, although you might find something like a 15, 15, 15. I'm not too worried about the numbers. I'm more just looking for something that's going to give them an even distribution of each of the macro nutrients. All right, another one here. Um. How can the holiday cactus easily be propagated? Oh, that's a nice, easy one to propagate. Um, so honestly, I'm gonna steal my examples right here. So honestly, I wouldn't take, I would take a small part of a plant, something like this, um, pinch it off, you know, right at the, where the leaf joint meets the next leaf. And what I would do is let it dry for, you're gonna, and actually this is gonna work for, just about anything that's a succulent, let it dry for a couple of days on a countertop. And then what I would do is I would set it in something that is um, very, very fine. So uh, a seed starting mix is gonna work really nicely. Something that's peat based with a little bit of vermiculite, maybe some perlite, um, that's gonna work fantastic for you. Really any uh, potting mix that's appropriate for container planting, something that's peat or coconut core, Based. It's going to work really nicely for you. And then what I would do is I would put it um, in a very shallow container with that mix. Um, I would only set it in just a little bit. Don't want long stretches of the plant. You just want, you know, the, the tip of a plant. Put that in there. Keep it moist. Um, it's probably going to take, I don't know, maybe three to six weeks or so, and it will take root. Um, you're not going to pot it up into a larger size container until the roots are nicely distributed with it throughout that container. So the containers that I start my plants out in, I'm shooting for something that's going to be somewhere in the two to four inch size. Okay, I know we didn't get to the amaryllis, but I do have a question here concerning amaryllis. How serious is red blotch on amaryllis? I save my amaryllis bulbs and replant every year. How can I protect them from red blotch? For example, do I soak them in bleach solution before dormancy? Oh, you know what? So uh, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I don't have a good answer for you off the top of my head. Um, I just put my email address inside of the chat. Um, if you could reach back out to me because I don't want to, my hunch is going to be probably dust them in a sulfur, uh, sulfur dust, but I'm not positive that that is going to solve that problem. So um, reach back out to me and let me uh, re kind of go through some resources and see if I can get a good answer for you. 
I think we've got time for maybe one more here real quick. How do you prune the cacti? Mine is about four feet in diameter and many, many years old. Um, so what you may want to do right now, I don't think that I would do anything to it right now because it's about to go into flower. If it's either the Thanksgiving or the Christmas ones, I would wait until it's not in flower. Probably in springtime would be a great time to go ahead and do that. And I think what I would do is um, either uh, if it's a four feet in diameter, my guess is you're probably trying to reduce the entire plant size rather than just pruning off the top. So then what I would do is take it out of the pot and I would honestly just split it. Um, you could split it with a old serrated cake knife. Um, just want to get in there and basically split it, cut it down into, uh, if it's four feet in diameter. So I'm imagining maybe a 12 to 14 inch size pot. You probably split that into four separate sections. And then you're going to want to keep it. So after you go through that splitting phase, you know, you do that to it, it's going to go through some stress. So you're going to want to um, make sure that you're keeping an eye on the water. Uh, so that way it can recover from that stress nicely. Well, Janelle, time is up. It's 1230. We thank you so much for giving this presentation. We want to remind everybody, if you haven't already, please click on that survey link that's in the chat box. And we hope you enjoyed our presentation. It'll, this pre presentation will be is recorded and will be on the horticulture website if you want to catch it or listen again or share it with others. Thanks again, Janelle, for presenting. And thanks, Tim, for being the co-moderator. Bye, everybody.